Oh, I couldn't wait. <laughs> More that I had time today, so I'm recording chapter 20 now. If you see it and then it disappears, well, it won't help because it'll be on this video, but don't worry. It'll come back tomorrow. I'll save it to be posted tomorrow. <clears throat> chapter 20. I had forgotten to draw my curtain, which I usually did, and also to let my window blind. The consequence was that when the moon, which was full and bright, for the night was fine, came in her course to that space in the sky opposite my casement, and looked in at me through the unveiled panes, her glorious gaze roused me. Awaking in the dead of night, I opened my eyes on her disk, silver, white, and crystal clear. It was a beautiful, but too solemn. I half rose and stretched my arm to draw the curtain. Good God, what a cry! The night, its silence, its rest, was rent in twain by a savage, a sharp, a shrilly sound that ran from end to end of Thornfield Hall. My pulse stopped, my heart stood still, my stretched arm was paralyzed. The cry died and was not renewed. Indeed, whatever being uttered that fearful shriek could not soon repeat it. Not the widest winged condor on the Andes could, twice in succession, send out such a yell from the cloud shrouding its ire. The thing delivering such utterance must rest ere it could repeat the effort. It came out of the third story, for it passed overhead, and overhead, yes, in the room just above my chamber ceiling, I now heard a struggle, a deadly one it seemed from the noise, and a half-smothered voice shouted, Help! 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 Three times rapidly. Will no one come? It cried. And then, while the staggering and stamping went on wildly, I distinguished through the plank and plaster. Rochester! Rochester, for God's sake, come! A chamber door opened. Someone ran or washed along the gallery. Another step stamped on the flooring above, and something fell, and there was silence. I had put on some clothes. The horror shook all my limbs. I issued from my apartment. The sleepers were all aroused. Ejaculations, terrified murmurs sounded in every room, door after door, unclosed. They looked out, and another looked out. The gallery filled. Gentlemen and ladies alike had quitted their beds, and— Oh, what is it? Who is hurt? What has happened? Fetch a light! Is it fire? Or there robbers? Where shall we run? Was demanded confusedly on all hands, but for the moonlight they would have been in complete darkness. They ran to and fro, they crowded together, some sobbed, some stumbled. The confusion was inextricable. Where the devil is Rochester? cried Colonel Dent. I cannot find him in his bed. Here, here, was shouted in return. Be composed, all of you. I'm coming. And the door at the end of the gallery opened, and Mr. Rochester advanced with a candle. He had just descended from the upper story. One of the ladies ran to him directly. She seized his arm. It was Miss Ingram. What awful event has taken place, said she. Speak, let us know the worst at once. But don't pull me down or strangle me, he replied, for the Mrs. Eshton were clinging about him now, and the two dowagers, in vast white wrappers, were bearing down on him like ships in full sail. All's right, all's right, he cried. It's a mere rehearsal of much ado about nothing. Ladies, keep off, or I shall wax dangerous. And dangerous he looked. His black eyes darted sparks. Calling himself by an effort, he added, A servant has had a nightmare. That is all. She's an excitable, nervous person. She construed a dream into an apparition or something of the sort, no doubt, and has taken a fit with fright. Now then... I must see you all back into your rooms, for till the house is settled she cannot be looked after. Gentlemen have the goodness to set the ladies the example. 
Miss Ingram, I am sure you would not fail in advising superiority to idle terrors. Amy and Louisa, return to your nests like a pair of doves, as you are. Madame's, to the dowagers, you will take cold to dead certainty if you stay in this chill gallery any longer. And so, by dint of alternate coaxing and commanding, he contrived to get them all once more enclosed in their separate dormitories. I did not wait to be ordered back to mine, but retreated unnoticed, and unnoticed I had left it. Not, however, to go to bed. On the contrary, I began and dressed myself carefully. The sounds I had heard after that scream, and the words that had been uttered, had probably only been heard by me, for they had proceeded from the room above mine, but they assured me that it was not a servant's dream which had thus struck horror through the house, and that the explanation Mr. Rochester had given was merely an invention framed to pacify his guests. I dressed then to be ready for emergencies. When dressed, I sat a long time by the window, looking out over the silent grounds and silvered fields and waiting for I knew not what. It seemed to me that some event must follow this strange cry, struggle, and call. No. Stillness returned. Each murmur and movement ceased gradually, and in about an hour Thornfield Hall was again all hushed as a desert. It seemed that sleep and night had returned their empire. Meantime the mood declined. She was about to set. Not liking to sit in the cold and darkness, I thought I would lie down on my bed, dressed as I was. I left the window and moved with little noise across the carpet as I stooped to take off my shoes. A cautious hand tapped low at the door. "'Am I wanted?' I asked. "'Are you up?' asked the voice I expected to hear. "'My master's.' "'Yes, sir.' "'And dressed?' "'Yes.' Come out then, quietly. I obeyed. Mr. Rochester stood in the gallery, holding a light. I want you, he said. Come this way. Take your time and make no noise. The slippers were thin. I could walk the matted floors as softly as a cat. He glided up the gallery and up the stairs and stopped in the dark, low corridor of the fateful third story. I had followed and stood at his side. "'Have you a sponge in your room?' he asked in a whisper. "'Yes, sir.' "'Have you any salts?' "'Volatile salts.' "'Yes.' "'Go back and fetch them both.' I returned sought the sponge on the washstand, the salts in my drawer, and once more retraced my steps. He still waited. He held a key in his hand. Approaching one of the small black doors, he put it in the lock. He paused and addressed me again. You don't turn sick at the sight of blood. I think I shall not. I have never been tried yet. I felt a thrill while I answered him, but no coldness and no faintness. "'Just give me your hand,' he said. "'It will not do to risk a fainting fit.' "'I put my figures into him. "'Warm and steady,' was his remark. "'He turned the key and opened the door. "'I saw a room I remembered to have seen before, "'the day Mrs. Fairfax showed me over the house. "'It was hung with tapestry, "'but the tapestry was now looped up in one part, "'and there was a door apparent, "'which had then been concealed.' This door was open. A light shone out of the room within. I heard thence a snarling, snatching sound, almost like a dog quarrelling. Mr. Rochester, putting down his candle, said to me, "'Wait a minute,' and he went forward into the inner apartment. A shout of laughter greeted his entrance, noisy at first, and terminating in Grace Poole's own goblin. Ha, <laughs> ha! She then was there. He made some sort of arrangement without speaking, though I heard low voice address him. He came out and closed the door behind him. "'Here, Jane,' he said, and I walked round to the other side of the large bed, which, with its drawn curtains, concealed a considerable portion of the chamber. 
An easy chair was near the bed head. A man sat in it, dressed with the exception of his coat. He was still, his head leant back, his eyes were closed. Mr. Rochester held the candle over him. I recognised in his pale and seemingly lifeless face the stranger, Mason. I saw, too, that his linen on one side and one arm was almost soaked in blood. "'Hold the candle,' said Mr. Rochester, and I took it. He fetched a basin of water from the washstand. "'Hold that,' said he. I obeyed. He took the sponge, dipped it in, and moistened the corpse-like face. He asked for my smelling bottle, and applied it to the nostrils. Mr. Mason shortly unclosed his eyes. He groaned. Mr. Rochester opened the shirt of the wounded man, whose arm and shoulder were bandaged. He sponged away blood, trickling fast down. "'Is there immediate danger?' murmured Mr. Mason. Puh, "'Not a mere scratch. Don't be some overcome man. Bear up. I'll fetch a surgeon for you now myself. You'll be able to be removed by morning, I hope. Jane,' he continued, "'Sir, I shall have to leave you in this room with this gentleman for an hour, or perhaps two hours. You will sponge the blood as I do when it returns. If he feels faint, you will put the glass of water on that stand to his lips, and your salts to his nose. You will not speak to him on any pretext, and, Richard, it will be at the peril of your life if you speak to her. Open your lips, agitate yourself, and I'll not answer for the consequences. Again the poor man groaned. He looked as if he dared not move. Fear, either of death or of something else, appeared almost to paralyse him. Mr. Rochester put the now bloody sponge into my hand, and I proceeded to use it as he had done. He watched me a second, then saying, "'Remember, no conversation!' He left the room. I experienced a strange feeling as the key grated in the lock, and the sound of his retreating step ceased to be heard. Here, then I was, in the third story, fastened into one of his mystic cells, night around me, a pale and bloody spectacle under my eyes and hands, a murderess, hardly separated from me by a single door. Yes, that was appalling. The rest I could bear, but I shuddered at the thought of Grace pool bursting out upon me. I must keep to my post, however. I must watch this ghastly countenance, these blue, still lips, forbidden to unclose, these eyes now shut, now opening, now wandering through the room, now fixing on me, and ever glazed with the dullness of horror. I must dip my hand again and again in the basin of blood and water, and wipe away the trickling gore. I must see the light of the unsnuffed candle wane on my employment. The shadows darken on the rot antique tapestry round me, and grow black under the hangings of the vast old bed, and quiver strangely over the doors of a great cabinet opposite, whose front, divided into twelve panels, bore in grim design the heads of the twelve apostles, each enclosed in its separate panel as in a frame, while above them at the top rose an ebon crucifix and a dying Christ. According as the shifting obscurity and flickering gleam hovered here or glanced there, it was now the bearded physician, Luke, that bent his brow. Now St. John's long hair that waved, and anon the devilish face of Judas that grew out of the panel, and seemed gathering life and threatening a revelation of the arch-traitor, of Satan himself, in his subordinate's form. Amidst all this I had to listen as well as watch, to listen for the movements of the wild beast or the fiend in yonder side den, but thence Mr. Rochester's visit seemed spellbound all the night I heard but three sounds at three long intervals, a step creak, a momentary renewal of the snarling canine noise, and a deep human groan. 
Then my own thoughts worry me. What crime was this that lived incarnate in the sequestered mansion and could neither be expelled nor subdued by the owner? What mystery that broke out now in fire and now in blood at the deadest hours of night? What creature was it that, masked in an ordinary woman's face and shape, uttered the voice now of a mocking demon and anon of a carrion-seeking bird of prey? And this man I bent over, this commonplace, quiet stranger, how had he become involved in the web of horror? And why had the fury flown at him? What made him seek this quarter of the house at an untimely season, when he should have been asleep in bed? I had heard Mr. Rochester assign him an apartment below. What brought him here? And why now was he so tame under the violence or treachery done him? Why did he so quietly submit the concealment Mr. Rochester enforced? Why did Mr. Rochester enforce his concealment? This guest had been outraged. His own life on a former occasion had been hideously plotted against, and both attempts he smothered in secrecy and sank in oblivion. Lastly, I saw Mr. Basin was submissive to Mr. Rochester, that the impetuous will of the latter held complete sway over the inertness of the former. The few words which had passed between them assured me of this. It was evident that in their former intercourse the passive disposition of the one had been habitually influenced by the active strategy of the other. Whence they had arisen, Mr. Rochester's dismay, when he heard of Mr. Mason's arrival. Why had the mere name of his unresisting individual, whom his word now sufficed to control like a child, fallen on him a few hours since, as a thunderbolt might fall on an oak? Oh, I could not forget his look and his paleness when he whispered, Jane, I have got a blow, I have got a blow, Jane. I could not forget how the arm had trembled which he rested on my shoulder, and it was no light manner which could thus bow the resolute spirit and thrill the vigorous frame of Fairfax Rochester. When will he come? When will he come? I cried inwardly, as the night lingered and lingered, as my bleeding patient drooped, moaned, sickened, and neither day nor aid arrived. I had again and again held the water to Mason's white lips, again and again offered him the stimulating salts. My effort seemed ineffectual, either bodily or mental suffering, or loss of blood, or all three combined, were fast prostrating his strength. He moaned so, and looked so weak, wild, and lost. I feared he was dying, and I might not even speak to him. The candle, wasted at last, went out. As it expired, I perceived streaks of grey light edging the window curtains. Dawn was then approaching. Presently I heard Pilot bark far below out of his distant kennel in the courtyard. Hope revived. Nor was it unwarranted. In five minutes more the grating key, the yielding lock, warned me my watch was relieved. It could not have lasted more than two hours. Many a week has seemed shorter. Mr. Rochester entered, and with him the servant he had been to fetch. Now, Carter, be on the alert, he said to this last. I give you but half an hour for dressing the wound, fastening the bandages, getting the patient downstairs, and all. But is he fit to move, sir? No doubt of it. This is nothing serious. He is nervous. His spirits must be kept up. Come, sir, to work. Mr. Rochester drew back the thick curtain, drew up the hall and blind, let in all the daylight he could, and I was surprised and cheered to see how far dawn had advanced. What rosy streaks were beginning to brighten the east. Then he approached Mason, who the surgeon was already handling. Now, my good fellow, how are you? he asked. She's done for me, I fear, was the faint reply. Not a whit! Courage! This day fortnight you'll hardly be a pin the worse of it. You've lost a little blood, that's all, Carter. Assure him there's no danger. I can do that conscientiously, 
said Carter, who had now undone the bandages. Only I wish I could have got here sooner. He would not have bled so much. But how is this? The flesh on the shoulder is torn as well as cut. This wound was not done with a knife. There have been teeth here. She bit me, he murmured. She worried me like a tigress when Rochester got the knife from her. You should not have yielded. You should have grappled with her at once, said Mr. Rochester. But under such circumstances, what could one do? returned Mason. Oh, it was frightful, he added, shuddering. And I did not expect it. She looked so quiet at first. I warned you, was his friend's answer. I said, be on your guard when you go near her. Besides, you might have waited till tomorrow and had me with you. It was mere folly to attempt the interview tonight, and alone. I thought I could have done some good. You thought? You thought? Yes, it makes me impatient to hear you. But however you have suffered, and are likely to suffer enough for not taking my advice. So I'll say no more. Carter, hurry! Hurry! Soon the sun will rise, and I must have him off. Directly, sir. The shoulder is just bandaged. I must look at this other wound in the arm. She has had her teeth here, too, I think. She sucked the blood. She said she drained my heart, said Mason. I saw Mr. Rochester shudder. A singularly marked expression of disgust, horror, hatred, warped his countenance almost to distortion, but he only said, Come, be silent, Richard, and never mind her gibberish. Don't repeat it. I wish I could forget it, was the answer. You will when you are out to the country. When you get back to Spanish town, you may think of her as dead and buried, or rather you need not think of her at all. Impossible to forget this night. It is not impossible. Have some energy, man. You thought you were as dead as a herring two hours since, and you are all alive and talking now. There, Carter has done with you all nearly so. I'll make you decent and trice. Jane, he turned to me for the first time since his re-entrance, take this key. Go down into my bedroom and walk straight forward into my dressing room, and open the shirt at the drawer of the wardrobe, and take out one clean shirt and a neck handkerchief. Bring them here, and be nimble. I went, sought the repository he had mentioned, found the articles named, and returned with them. Now, said he, go to the other side of the bed while I order his toilet, but don't leave the room. You may be wanted again. I retired as directed. Was anybody stirring below when you went down, Jane? inquired Mr. Rochester presently. No, sir. All was very still. We shall get you off cannily, Dick, and it will be better for you both, and for that poor creature in yonder. I have striven long to avoid exposure, and I should not like it to come at last. Here, Carter, help him on with his waistcoat. Where did you leave your furred coat? You can't travel a mile without it, I know, in this damned cold climate. In your room? Jane, run down to Mr. Mason's room, the one next to mine, and fetch a cloak you will see there. Again I ran, and again returned, bearing an immense mantle lined and edged with fur. Now, I've another errand for you, said my untiring master. You must go away to my room again. What a mercy you are shod with velvet, Jane. A clod-hopping messenger would never do at this juncture. You must open the middle drawer of my toilet table and take out a little phial and a little glass you will find there. Quick! I flew thither and back, bringing the desired vessels. That's well. Now, doctor, I shall take the liberty of administering a dose myself on my own responsibility. I got this cordial in Rome of an Italian charlatan. A fellow you would have kicked, Carter. It was not a thing to be used indiscriminately, but it is good upon occasion. As now, for instance. Jane, a little water. He held out the tiny glass, and I half filled it with the water bottle on the washstand. That will do. And now wet the lip of the fire. I did so. 
he measured twelve drops of a crimson liquid and presented it to Mason. Drink, Richard. It will give you the heart you lack for an hour or so. But will it hurt me? Is it inflammatory? Drink, drink, drink! Mr. Mason obeyed, because it was evidently useless to resist. He was dressed now. He still looked pale, but he was no longer gory and sullied. Mr. Rochester let him sit three minutes after he had swallowed the liquid. He then took his arm. "'Now I am sure you can get on your feet,' he said. "'Try.' The patient rose. "'Carter, take him under the other's shoulder. Be of good cheer, wretched. Step out. That's it.' "'I do feel better,' remarked Mr. Mason. "'I am sure you do. "'Now, Jane, trip on before us away to the back stairs. "'Unbolt the side passage door "'and tell the driver of the post-chaise "'you will see him in the yard, or just outside, "'for I told him not to drive his rattling wheels over the pavement. "'To be ready, we are coming. "'And, Jane, if anyone is about, "'come to the foot of the stairs and hem.' "'It was by this time,' Half past five, and the sun was on the point of rising, but I found the kitchen still dark and silent. The side passage door was fastened. I opened it with as little noise as possible. All the yard was quiet, but the gate stood wide open, and there was a post chaise with horses ready harnessed and driver seated on the box stationed outside. I approached him and said the gentlemen were coming. He nodded. Then I looked carefully round and listened. The stillness of early morning slumbered everywhere. The curtains were yet drawn over the servants' chamber windows. Little birds were twittering in the blossom-blanched orchard trees, whose boughs dropped like white garlands over the wall enclosing one side of the yard. The carriage horses stamped from time to time in their closed stables. All else was still. The gentlemen now appeared. Mason, supported by Mr. Rochester and the surgeon, seemed to walk with tolerable ease. They assisted him into the chaise, and Mr. Carter followed. "'Take care of him,' said Mr. Rochester to the latter, "'and keep him at your house till he is quite well. I shall ride over in a day or two and see how he gets on. Richard, how is it with you?' "'The fresh air revives me, Fairfax. "'Leave the window open on his side, Carter. There is no wind.' "'Good-bye, Dick.' "'Fairfax! Well, what is it?' "'Let her be taken care of. Let her be treated as tenderly as may be. Let her—' He stopped and burst into tears. "'I do my best, and have done it, and will do it,' was the answer. He shut up the chaise door, and the vehicle drove away. "'Yet would to God there was an end of all this,' added Mr. Rochester." as he closed and barred the heavy yard gates. This done, he moved with slow step and abstracted air towards a door in the wall bordering the orchard, I supposing he had done with me, prepared to return to the house again. However, I heard him call, Jane! He had opened field portal and stood at it, waiting for me. Come, where there is some freshness for a few moments, he said. That house is a mere dungeon. Don't you feel it so? It seems like a splendid mansion, sir. The glamour of experience is over your eyes, he answered, and you see it through a charmed medium. You cannot discern that the gliding is slime, and the silk draperies cobwebs, that the marble is sordid slate, and the polished woods mere refuse chips and scaly bark. Now here, he pointed to the leafy enclosure we had entered, all is real, sweet, and pure. He strayed down a walk edged with box, with apple trees, pear trees, and cherry trees on one side, and a border on the other full of all sorts of old-fashioned flowers, stalks, sweet williams, primroses, pansies, mingled with southern wood sweet briar, and various fragrant herbs. They were fresh now as a succession of April showers and gleams. The sun was just entering the dappled east, and his light illumined the wreathed and dewy orchard trees, and shone down the quiet walks upon them. "'Jane, will you have a flower?' 
he gathered a half-blown rose, the first on the bush, and offered it to me. Thank you, sir. Do you like the sunrise, Jane? That sky with its high and light clouds which are sure to melt away as the day waxes warm, this placid and balmy atmosphere. I do, very much. You have passed a strange night, Jane. Yes, sir. And it has made you look pale. Were you afraid when I left you alone with Mason? I was afraid of someone coming out of the inner room. But I had fastened the door. I had the key in my pocket. I should have been careless shepherd if I have left a lamb, my pet lamb, so near wolf's den unguarded. You were safe. Will Grace Poole live here still, sir? Oh, yes. Don't trouble your head about her. Put the thing out of your thoughts. Yet it seems to me your life is hardly secure while she stays. Never fear. I will take care of myself. Is the danger you apprehended last night gone by now, sir? I cannot vouch for that till Mason is out of England, nor even then. To live for me, Jane, is to stand on a crater crust which may crack and spew fire any day. But Mr. Mason seems a man easily led. Your influence, sir, is evidently potent with him. He will never set you at defiance or willfully injure you. Oh, no, Mason will not defy me, nor knowing it will he hurt me. But unintentionally, he might in a moment, by one careless word, deprive me, if not life, yet for ever of happiness. Tell him to be cautious, sir. Tell him, know what you fear. Show him how to avert the danger. He laughed sardonically, hastily took my hand, and as hastily threw it from him. If I could do that, simpleton, where would the danger be? Annihilate it in a moment. Ever since I have known Mason, I have only had to say to him, do that, and the thing has been done. But I cannot give him orders in this case. I cannot say, beware of harming me, Richard, for it is imperative that I should keep him ignorant that harm to me is possible. Now you look puzzled, and I will puzzle you further. You are my little friend, are you not? I like to serve you, sir, and to obey you in all that is right. Precisely. I see you do. I see genuine contentment in your gait and mane, your eye and face, when you are helping me and pleasing me, working for me and with me, and, as you characteristically say, all that is right. For if I bid you do what you thought wrong, there would be no light-footed running, no neat-handed alacrity, no lively glance and animated complexion. My friend would then turn to me, quiet and pale, and would say, No, sir, that is impossible, I cannot do it, because it is wrong, and would become immutable as a fixed star. Well, you too have power over me, and may injure me yet, yet I dare not show you where I am vulnerable, lest, faithful and friendly as you are, you should transfix me at once. If you have no more fear from Mr. Mason than you have from me, sir, you are very safe. God grant it may be so. Here, Jane, is an arbour. Sit down. The arbour was an arch with the wall, lined with ivy. It contained a rustic seat. Mr. Rochester took it down, leaving room, however, for me. But I stood before him. Sit, he said. The bench is long enough for two. You don't hesitate to take a place by my side, do you? Is that wrong, Jane? I answered him by assuming it. To refuse would, I felt, have been unwise. Now, my little friend, while the sun drinks the dew, while all the flowers in this old garden awake and expand, and the birds fetch their young ones breakfast out of Thornfield, and the early bees do their first spell of work, I'll put a case to you, which you must endeavour to suppose your own. But first, 
look at me, and tell me you are at ease, and not fearing that I err in detaining you, or that you err in staying. No, sir, I am content. Well then, Jane, call to aid your fancy. Suppose you were no longer a girl well reared and disciplined, but a wild boy, indulged from childhood upwards. Imagine yourself in a remote foreign land. Conceive that you there commit a capital error, no matter of what nature or from what motives, but one whose consequences must follow you through life and taint all your existence. Mind, I don't say a crime. I am not speaking of shedding blood or any other guilty act, which might make the perpetrator amenable to law. My word is error. The results of which you have done become in time to you utterly insupportable. You take measures to obtain relief, unusual measures, but neither unlawful nor culpable. Still you are miserable, for hope has quitted you on the very confines of life. Your sun at noon darkens in an eclipse, which you feel would not leave it till the time of setting. Bitter and base associations have become the sole food of your memory. You wander here and there, seeking rest in exile, happiness in pleasure, I mean in heartless, sensual pleasure, such as dulls intellect and blights feeling, heart-weary and soul-withered, you come home after years of voluntary banishment. You make a new acquaintance. How or where, no matter. You find in this stranger much of the good and bright qualities that you have sought for twenty years and never before encountered. And they are all fresh, healthy, without soil and without taint. Such society revives, regenerates. You feel better days come back. Higher wishes, purer feelings. You desire to recommence your life and to spend what remains to you of days in a more worthy of an immortal being. To attain this end, are you justified in overleaping an obstacle of custom? a mere conventional impediment which neither your conscience sanctifies nor your judgment approves. He paused here for an answer, and what was I to say? Or for some good spirit to suggest a judicious and satisfactory response? Vain aspiration! The west wind whispered in the ivy round me, but no gentle Ariel borrowed its breath as a medium of speech. The birds sang in the treetops, but their song, however sweet, was inarticulate. Again Mr. Rochester propounded his query. Is it the wandering and sinful, but now rest-seeking and repentant man, justified in daring the world's opinion, in order to retain for him an ever-gentle, gracious, and genial stranger, thereby securing his own peace of mind and regeneration of life? Sir, I answered, a wanderer's repose or a sinner's reformation should never depend on a fellow creature. Men and women die. Philosophers falter in wisdom and Christians in goodness. If any one you know has suffered and erred, let him look higher than his equals for strength to amend and solace to heal. But the instrument, the instrument, God, who does the work? obtains the instrument. I have myself, I tell it you without parable, been a worldly, dissipated, restless man, and I believe I have found the instrument for my cure in... He paused. The birds went on caroling, the leaves lightly rustling. I almost wondered they did not check their songs and whispers to catch the suspended revelation, but they would have worked to wait many minutes, so long the silence protracted. At least I looked up at the tardy speaker. He was looking eagerly at me. Little friend, he said, in quite a changed tone, while his face changed too, losing all its softness and gravity, and becoming harsh and sarcastic. 
You have noticed my tender penchant for Miss Ingram. Don't you think if I married her she would regenerate me with a vengeance? He got up instantly, went quite to the other side of the walk, and when he came back he was humming a tune. Jane, Jane, said he, stopping before me. You are quite pale with your vigils. Don't you curse me for disturbing the rest? Curse you? No, sir. Shake hands in confirmation of the word. What cold fingers! They were warmer last night when I touched them at the door of the mysterious chamber. Jane, when will you watch with me again? Whenever I can be useful, sir. For instance, the night before I am married, I am sure I shall not be able to sleep. Will you promise to sit up with me and bear me company? To you I can talk of my lovely one, for now you have seen her and know her. Yes, sir. She's a rare one, is she not, Jane? Yes, sir. A strapper, a real strapper, Jane. Big, brown and buxom with hair, just such as the ladies of Carthage must have had. Bless me, there's dent and lin in the stables. Go in by the shrubbery, through that wicket. As I went one way, he went another, and I heard him in the yard saying cheerfully, Mason got the start of you all this morning. He was gone before sunrise. I rose at four to see him off. Oh my goodness, that was chapter 20. Oh my gosh, this is so intense. So we've had such an intense chapter. We still don't know who Richard Mason is, but oh my goodness, what happened with Mason is so intense. What is the secret that is being hidden? And what is this chat that Mr. Rochester is having with Jane privately in the garden afterwards? What is he talking about? I feel like he's going back and forth between two things. Does Jane understand what's going on? Do you understand what's going on? I will see you tomorrow with chapter 21. Uh, bye-bye.